section X to the revengeful and D-U-E-L-L-I-S-T. Have you been injured, sir, and is it your determination to retaliate? Perhaps you hear the Christian name and would be highly displeased with anyone who should venture to suspect the sincerity of your religious profession. But have not you yourself reason to suspect it? Can a man be deemed a Christian, an heir to the blessings of the gospel, who in his heart and life disregards some of its plainest declarations? Can a man therefore be a Christian who is bent upon retaliation, who is of an unforgiving temper? Be pleased attentively to read the following passages of Scripture, and then let conscience speak. Matt. 5. 15. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Luke 11. 4. And forgive us our sins, for we also forgive every one that is indebted to us. In Matt XVI, where the absolute necessity of our exercising a forgiving temper towards those who have offended us is set forth by our Savior in a very striking parable, does not conscience say without the least hesitation, that man is no Christian who renders evil for evil, or harbors revenge in his breast. Again, a Christian is undoubtedly one that follows the example of Christ. 1 John 2, 6. He that saith be abideth in him. I, e, in Christ, ought himself also to walk even as he walked. But can that person be said to follow the example of Christ who returns injury for injury, and when he is reviled, reviles again? Was this, my dear reader, the temper and conduct manifested by the Son of God to his enemies? For an answer let me direct your eye towards that cross on which he hung a bleeding victim, and let me request you to hearken to his dying prayer for those who are treating him with the utmost cruelty and contempt. Father, forgive him. Luke 23, 34. For a further answer, let me remind you of the charge which Jesus Christ gave to his apostles to publish the gospel first to these same inhabitants of Jerusalem who had so lately murdered his reputation and taken away his life. Luke 24, 47. Now what is the natural inference conscience draws from these cases? But this, that the man who returns injury for injury, and when he is reviled, reviles again, is not the disciple of Jesus, the prince of peace, but of that malignant spirit Satan, the enemy of God and man. Whenever you find yourself inclined to revenge and unwilling to forgive, call to your remembrance. My dear sir, the above expressed passages contemplate at the same time the conduct of the deity towards us his rebellious creatures. How loath is he to take vengeance? How ready to be reconciled to transgressors? Isaiah Roman 43, 25, 2 Cor, V 19. And look at the proto-martyr imitating the example of his divine master in his expiring moments. Listen to his prayer for his murderers. Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Acts 7, 6, O. Oh, should your passions be ever suddenly raised, impose silence upon your tongue. Retire as soon as possible from the place of temptation, and beg of God to assist you in the work of self-government. Do not the preceding remarks show that was you to seek revenge instead of forgiving your adversary. The example of the merciful Jehovah, the example of the compassionate Savior, the word of truth, your own prayer, the example of a Stephen, I may add of a Crimer, and numbers besides would stand forth to condemn you. Nay, some of the heathens would rise up in judgment against you. Here I might mention Plato as an instance, who, being told that he had many enemies who spoke ill of him, answered, It is no matter, I will live so that none shall believe him, hearing at another time that an intimate friend of his had spoken disrespectfully of him. He replied, I am sure he would not have done it if he had not some reason for it. Hoping for my reader's serious attention, I would again have recourse to the sacred oracles, and extract from thence a brief account of that forgiveness which appears to be a necessary and very ornamental part of a true Christian's character. Where a person really forgives his enemy, he will not hurt him in deed or in word. 1 Pet, I, 9, neither will he will him ill, Prof. Ex Civ. 17. On the contrary, the person who sincerely forgives another will do him good, speak as favorably as he can of him consistent with truth, and pray for his enemy's welfare. Matt. V. 44. This is the forgiveness we are bound to exercise even towards the man who does not acknowledge his fault. Further, our forgiveness must extend not only to a few but many offenses. Matt. X. V. I. 21. 22. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times. Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. 
we are not to limit our forgiveness. Since we stand in continual need of divine pardon, our forgiveness must extend to great crimes as well as small verse 24, 27. And if the offending party confesses his fault and seems to be sincerely sorry for what he has done, we are to admit this our offending brother into friendship and familiarity again. For if we from the heart forgive a person, our heart must be towards him as formerly it was. Matt XVI 35. Is not this suitable to the conduct of the deity towards penitent sinners, who not only pardons but like wife takes them into a state of friendship and favor? This scripture moreover requires us to discharge this duty of forgiveness without delay. Mark 11. 25. F's. If. 26. Should you object that the exercise of such a forgiveness is the way to meet with repeated affronts, and is quite inconsistent with your present happiness. Granting, sir, that your objection was well founded, yet how can you possibly refuse the exercise of this virtue, since it is so strongly inculcated upon you both by the precepts and example of the author of our holy religion? And are you not expressly told that where this virtue is wanting, a man can't receive forgiveness from God? But may I not venture to affirm that in numerous cases, whereas opposition begets opposition, Forgiveness begets peace and kindness towards the party injured, and that the most rugged pieces of human nature are soonest overcome by gentle treatment. Is not this exemplified in the story related of a certain gentleman, Sec. 16, and also in what we read of Julius Caesar and Catullus? Catullus, having written satirical verses against Caesar, Caesar invited him to a supper and treated him with such civility that the poet became his steadfast friend. Suffer me to add, that to forgive and return good for evil yields the noblest present pleasure to the generous mind. And now what shall I say to the duelist? If our religion forbids the least revenge, shall we dare to take the greatest? I beseech you, sir, before you resolve either to send or accept a challenge, sit down and endeavor calmly and seriously to weigh the following points, and then methinks it would be impossible for you to proceed as I presume you must be convinced that such a conduct is destructive of your honor as well as happiness. Consider that the duelist exposes himself and likewise his friend to the character of a felon. Our law runs thus, if a duel is fought and one fall in the rencounter, the other is deemed guilty of murder, and so are the seconds. And is this honorable? The duelist, contrary to a fundamental law of civil society, perfumes upon being his own avenger. And is this honorable? A duelist may occasion unspeakable distress, doing irreparable mischief to a whole family by the attempt he makes upon the life of the head of it. And is this honorable? The duelist, to satisfy his revenge for the supposed affront, requires more than it. Hundredfold, and is this honorable? Yes, say some, but it may be asked, what makes it so custom and fashion? And is fashion possessed of such a power as to be able to alter the nature of things, to turn deformity into beauty, 66, and vice into virtue? If fashion cannot pretend to a power like this, and reason is allowed to be the fit judge of what is honorable, and what is dishonorable, I can no more give credit to the votary of fashion when he lays that dueling is an honorable practice than I can believe a person in a state of insanity who tells me that so light is black and bitter is sweet, for the four is as opposite to the plainest dictates of my reason, as the latter to the report of my senses. Exclude from the signification of the word honorable every idea of justice, and all that may tend to render an object amiable, then I allow the term may be applied to the duelist, should you plead that by refusing a compliance with this inhuman fashion you must expect to be shunned by those who style themselves men of honor, and become the butt of their derision, I reply, to be expelled from the society of such, instead of being a calamity, may prove a great advantage, as you may hereby be induced to seek an intimate acquaintance with men of a virtuous character, from whose example and conversation you may reap no small benefit, and with respect to your being laughed at by the giddy world, the reproach cast upon you on this occasion will redound to your praise amongst the truly polite and thoughtful part of mankind. There is a shame, says the son of Surach, which is glory and grace. Do you still say that you are obliged to comply with this French fashion in order to be distinguished from the coward? I answer, a coward may have this mark in common with yourself and others, for a coward has often fought, a coward has often conquered, but a coward never forgave. If therefore you would be distinguished from the coward, and obtain the character of a man of true courage, forgive an affront. To forgive and forget is the best proof of real magnanimity. Consider next, that as the practice of dueling is dishonorable, 
so it may give a moral stab to your present peace and comfort and your future felicity should the duelist kill his opponent yet the reflection upon the cruel act must pain him to the soul and what anguish must he feel supposing the deceased was once his affectionate friend or particular acquaintance or if the duelist dies in the contest how horrible his situation for does he not die with a mind full of rage malice pride hatred and see and can a spirit that leaves the world under the influence of these malignant passions be admitted into those blissful abodes where humility love kindness and peace reign in every breast no says reason no says scripture such a spirit is utterly incapable of living in these pure and calm regions one john three fifteen he that hateth his brother is a murderer and we know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him oh my dear reader muse for a few moments on that life of which the apostle speaks consider tis a life to be led in that glorious city the new jerusalem ref xxi a life with benevolent angels and the spirits of just men made perfect in every amiable virtue hep ci twenty two twenty three a life with the savior of the world john seventeen twenty four a life in the more immediate presence of the great father of the universe ref xi four having said thus much it may be almost needless to add that tis a life free from all pain and sorrow rev xxi four a life that abounds with the most solid pleasures in these forever rev the i sixteen seventeen who would not submit to a state of the deepest disgrace on earth rather than be cut off from this life this eternal life eternal life transporting sound let it go from pole to pole penetrate the regions of the deep rise to the third heavens and mingle with the melodious songs of angels eternal life eternal life for dying men the gift of god through jesus christ our lord wrong by twenty three